Howdy folks! In this microeconomics lesson, we are going to continue with our understanding of elasticity. And uh, in the last lesson, we did price elasticity of demand, and we talked about a whole lot of stuff, calculating price elasticity of demand. Well, I have good news for you. Today, you're going to use basically the exact same formula. So if you already remember, if you already understand how to do those calculations, you're going to do them in the exact same way for the other three kinds of elasticity that we're going to learn about today. We are going to learn about, and I mentioned these in the, in the last lesson, income elasticity of demand, cross elasticity of demand, and then the last one we're going to learn about is price elasticity of supply, okay? And we are going to start with income elasticity of demand. All right, so let me remind you how we calculated price elasticity of demand. Price elasticity of demand was equal to the percentage change in quantity demanded divided by the percentage change in price. So it's the responsiveness of quantity demanded to a change in price. Well, what we're going to talk about now is income elasticity of demand. So what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of the price and we're going to change it to an I, which is representing income. And we're going to change the price in the bottom of this formula to income. I'm just going to kind of write income here. I don't want to uh, confuse income with investment. I don't want to put an I there because you know from the formula in macroeconomics, uh, GDP is equal to C plus, uh, of course I'm using C and cross. Well, anyway, forget it. Uh, but anyway, we've got percentage change in income. Now here's the thing. With price elasticity of demand, it made sense to compare price with quantity demanded because they are directly related to each other on the market graph. We have price on the vertical axis. We have quantity demanded on the horizontal axis. In fact, let's put that right here. We've got quantity here. We've got price here. And when we draw a demand curve here, we know that when price increases that quantity demanded is going to decrease. But we do not have income on this graph. And therefore, the relationship between income and quantity demanded is an indirect relationship. An indirect relationship between income and quantity demanded. But I want to go back a couple lessons. And I want to remind you that even though the relationship between income and quantity demanded is indirect, that there is a direct relationship between income and demand. So a change in income, we know, can cause a change in demand. Not quantity demanded, a change in demand. Meaning that there is an entire shift of the whole curve. I want to remind you that when incomes increase, that assuming this is a normal good, if this is a normal good, then when consumers' incomes increase, demand will increase. People will want to buy more of this stuff. And that means that the entire demand curve will shift to the right. Do you remember that? I hope you remember that. And so if I were to throw a supply curve in here, let's say right there, watch what we'll see. So directly, when income increases, Demand increases by shifting to the right. But with the supply curve in there, we can see right here that that is equilibrium quantity. And remember that equilibrium quantity is where quantity supplied is equal to quantity demanded. So equilibrium quantity is the same thing as quantity demanded at the market price. Now, when income increases and the demand curve increases and shifts to the right, you can see now that we have a new market price. The price is now going up, which is then causing a change in equilibrium quantity. And a change in equilibrium quantity is a change in quantity demanded. So you can see here that an increase in income results indirectly, indirectly, in an increase in quantity demanded. Directly, it's causing an increase in demand. 
but indirectly it's causing an increase in quantity demanded. And so there is a relationship between income and quantity demanded. And that relationship is what uh, income elasticity of demand wants to understand. Now I also want to remind you one more thing, that if this was an inferior good, if this was an inferior good, we would have a different dynamic. It, well, it's the same dynamic, but it would go opposite. That if we had the demand curve right here, if there was an increase in price and it was an inferior good, then demand would decrease. People are going to buy less of it because they have enough money to go buy the good stuff that they want to buy. And so they're going to stop buying inferior goods, so we would actually have a decrease, D prime there, that's a leftward shift of the demand curve. And so if we put a supply curve in here, you can see here's quantity or equilibrium quantity. When there's an increase in price and it's an inferior good, demand decreases and we have a decrease in quantity demanded. Okay? And so what you're going to see here is that, uh, that there is indeed a relationship between income and quantity demanded, and that's what we're going to focus these calculations on, okay? And so uh, after I show you how to calculate, after we do some examples of calculating income elasticity of demand, then we're going to do, uh, we're going to identify what the number means, okay? But I do want to remind you that this percentage change in quantity demanded over percentage change in income, I'll put that up here. Percentage change in quantity demanded over percentage change in income can be calculated by doing the new quantity demanded minus the old quantity demanded, oops, quantity demanded, divided by the average quantity demanded all divided by, so this is going to give us this numerator number, this, this fraction up here is going to give us our percentage change in quantity demanded, and then down here we would have new income minus old income divided by average income, the average between the two, not average Oh, average. Not the average in society. In fact, this new income is the new average in society. The old income is the old average in society. This average is the average between the new and old. Average income, which is halfway between the new income and the old income. Okay, let's do some examples. All right, I would like to do three examples. Let's start over here on the left. And here's our first situation. In the first situation, uh, income is going to increase. So let's say consumer's income in society, consumer's incomes increase from $2,500 a month up to $2,800 a month. Okay, so that's our income. And when income changes, there's kind of a chain reaction. The demand curve shifts and then quantity, you know, the price changes and then quantity demanded is going to change. And the uh, the new or old quantity demanded when incomes were 2,500 was 700 units, let's say per month, and now quantity demanded has increased to 750 units. And so we're going to use this formula right here. We're going to calculate the percentage change in quantity, and we're going to put it over the percentage change in income. All right, so. The, for the percentage change in quantity, the new quantity is 750, the old quantity is 700, and the average between 750 and 700 is 725. And you can get that by adding these two numbers together. You get 1450, divide by 2, and you'll get, uh, you'll get 725. So that is the percentage change in quantity demanded over the percentage change in income. The new income is 2,800 minus the old income, 2,500 over halfway between 2,800 and 2,500 is, let's see here, 150, 2,650 is 2,650, okay? And so now we're going to grab a calculator and we're going to do 750 minus 700, that's 50 divided by 725. 
And that's going to give us 0 0.06, so 0 0.06. 8966. 8966. Yes, I did round that sixth uh, digit there. All over, you could make it a five if you want to, I don't care. Uh, all over, 2800 minus 2500 is 300, divided by 2650, and that gives us 0 0.113, 0 0.11, oops, make that a decimal, 113208. 208. And you can make this 8 and 8 or a 7. I rounded it up to an 8. Now, the reason I don't care about the sixth digit is because as we move out from the decimal, that digit, the digits become less and less significant because we're going to round our answer to either two or three decimal places. This sixth digit doesn't matter as much. That's why I say I don't care if you make this a 5 or a 6, and I don't care whether you make this a 7 or an 8. All right, so let's go ahead and... Uh, Key these in, key this calculation in. Do the numerator divided by the denominator, and I get 0.609. I'm going to actually just put 0.61. That's what I'm going to put as my answer. And so the income elasticity of demand for this particular product, when incomes went up, by, up from 2,500 to 2,800, and quantity demanded de uh, increased from 700 to 750, that indicates that this product, whatever this product is, has an income elasticity of demand. Its sensitivity to changes in income is 0.61. Now I want to do a second example. All right, in the second example, let's say that income in, out there in society, income, let's say that it decreases from 4,000 Incomes go down from $4,000, let's say, a month to $3,800 a month. Okay? When that happens, the quantity demanded of this product that we're looking at goes from, let's see here, goes from uh, 300 units up to 360. So income went down and quantity demanded went up. So let's go ahead and calculate our uh, income elasticity of demand. Uh, we're going to do the quantity in the numerator. So we're going to do 360 minus 300. So new quantity, new quantity is 360. Old quantity is 300. Divided by the average between these two is 330. Average is 330. All divided by, now we're going to do the income. Uh, new income is 3,800. 3,800 minus 4,000 divided by the average between these two incomes, and the average would then be 3,900. So let's grab a calculator. The numerator here, 360 minus 300, that's 60. 60 divided by 330, I got 0 0.181818. All right, so 0 0.181818 over 3,800 minus 4,000, that's negative 200. So negative 200 divided by 3,900. That's going to be negative 0 0.051282. And now when I, when I make this calculation, divided by, I get negative 3.545. Negative 3.545. And now this is interesting because this is now a negative value. Over here, we had a positive, we had a positive income elasticity of demand, and over here we got a negative income elasticity of demand. That matters. I'm not going to tell you why it matters for a couple more minutes. We're going to do one more example, but that, that matters, okay? Unlike price elasticity of demand, we are not going to make our negative income elasticity of demand. We're not going to make it positive. We're going to leave it as negative. That matters. Okay? Let's do one more example over here. Let's see here. Income elasticity of demand. Let's go with, okay, let's say incomes, uh, annual incomes in, increase from 30, 32, let's say income. Annual incomes increase from 32,000 up to 32,700. 32,700. And when that happens, quantity demand 
demanded changes, goes from 525 units up to 550 units. And so now we're going to use our formula here. We're going to do the demand, uh, or sorry, yeah, demand in the numerator. So new, new quantity demanded is 550 minus old quantity demanded is 525. And the average between the two, I'm going to go ahead and do this in the calculator. I can do it in my head, but you may, I don't know if you can. So 550 plus 525 divided by 2 would give me the average between, and it's 537.5. Okay, so there's the numerator. And now, let's put that right there. And now for income, new income is 32,700 minus old income is 32,000 divided by, the average between the two is 32,350. Okay, now let's calculate each one of these. Numerator, 550 minus 525, that's 25. Divided by 537, 50. 537 and 50, that's a, that's 0.0465. Now I'm going to talk about this number, 0.0465. 1, 2 over, now let me talk about this, see these, all these decimal numbers? I didn't talk about it in the last lesson in Price Elasticity of Demand. Um, I, I alluded to it, but now I'm going to get very specific. What this means right here is that quantity demanded changed by about 6.9%. There was a 6.9% increase in quantity demanded. Whilst, while at the same time, there was about an 11.3% increase in income. So an 11.3% increase in income caused a 6.9% increase in quantity demanded. We had a larger percentage in income and a smaller percentage in quantity demanded. And that's why we wound up with an income elasticity of demand that is less than one. Now here, we had an 18% sorry, 18% increase in quantity demanded. But do you see this negative on income? That's because we had a drop in income. Incomes decreased by 5%. When income went, incomes went down by 5%, quantity demanded went up by 18%. And I hope you're thinking about what that means about this product. And so now over here, what this 0.0465 means is that there was a 4.65% increase in quantity demanded. Well, let's see what our, our percentage increase in income was. Well, 32,700 minus 32,000 is 700. Divided by 32,350 gives us 0.021638. 0.021638. We had a 4.65% in, increase in quantity demanded, but there was only a 2.16 increase in income. So our change in quantity demanded was actually a much larger percentage than our change in income was, and that's going to be meaningful. So let's go ahead and divide these numbers, 0.046512 divided by 0.021638, and I get 2.15. So this is going to be 2.15. There we go. Now this is a positive income elasticity of demand that is larger than one. So let me tell you, the first thing that we would say is this. Here, income elasticity of demand is inelastic because the value is less than one. When I say less than one, the magnitude is less than one. Okay, there is, it, it, when I say magnitude, like over here, the magnitude means we get rid of the negative. So the magnitude here is larger than 1. 3.545 is larger than 1, even though the number negative 3.545 is not larger than 1. That's a negative number. All negative numbers are less than 1. But the magnitude, if you ignore the negative, the magnitude is larger than 1. And it's the magnitude that indicates whether it's elastic, unitary, or inelastic. So what we have over here is we have inelastic income elasticity of demand. Here we have elastic. We 
you have elastic income elasticity of demand. And over here, larger than one, again, we have elastic income elasticity of demand. But here's what I want you to learn. This is the last thing I'm going to teach you about income elasticity of demand. Now we're moving on to cross elasticity of demand. What's most important here is that these three numbers represent different kinds of products. And so here's the lesson. This is the last thing I'm teaching you. Make sure you write this down. When income elasticity of demand is positive, positive, all right, so income elasticity of demand is positive and, uh, and less than one, or the magnitude is less than one, but it's positive. This product is called a normal good. This is a normal good, like this is probably gasoline right here. I mean, not gasoline, it's probably, actually it's probably not gasoline. People don't usually buy a lot more gasoline when their income goes up. They're probably buying what they're buying. But, you know, normal stuff, like we said in the last lesson, uh, you know, it's milk, it's bread, uh, gasoline, just regular stuff that people buy, okay? There's not much change in how much they buy when their income goes up. So this is called a normal good. Here, we got this weird situation where income went down, but quantity demanded went up. Well, if you recall from a couple lessons ago, this is a situation of an inferior good. So whenever you get a negative, if a negative income elasticity of demand will tell you that that product isn't, this is normal over here, that product is an inferior good. So if income elasticity of demand is negative, you're dealing with an in inferior good. People buy less of it when their income goes up and they buy more of it when their income goes down. And over here, this one we haven't talked about yet in previous lessons. Here's a situation where when we have an increase, even a small increase in income results in a lot of change in quantity demanded. When income elasticity of demand is positive and it's larger than one, we call these products luxuries. This is a luxury good. So the three kinds of goods that you can identify based on income elasticity of demand is whether the good is a normal good, an inferior good, and a luxury good. And you can actually calculate this given real numbers. So there could be a company and they don't know how people perceive their product. How do people perceive our product? Do people think our product is a luxury? Do people think our product is a normal good? Or do they think our product is an inferior good? Well, if you go get data like from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, if you go get data on income and then you also collect data on the demand for the product you sell and you run the calculation of income elasticity of demand and you find that the income elasticity of demand is negative, well then people perceive your product as an inferior product. That doesn't mean they're not gonna buy it. They just see it as the sort of thing that they buy when they have less money and that's okay. You now know how to market to those people, okay? All right, so that's income elasticity of demand. Let's now move on to cross elasticity of demand. All right, so with cross elasticity of demand here, what we're talking about is this. We're going across from one market, one product market over to another product market. We're dealing with actually two goods. And I want you to remember from the lesson on the determinants of demand, that one of the things that determines demand are the prices of related goods. Remember that? Prices of related whoops, goods. All right? And we learned that there are two main kinds of related goods. There are complements and there are substitutes. Now remember, that a substitute is a product that can give you the, you the same kind of utility that you're looking for as another product. Okay, so for example, you might decide for yourself you're going to go on vacation and one possibility for going on vacation is going to Disney World. And another possibility for going on vacation is going to the beach, you know, renting a beach house. Okay, um, so spending time vacationing at the beach is a substitute 
for vacationing at Disney World. Now, some people would argue, hey, that's no substitute at all. I'd much rather be at Disney World. The other person is going to say, hey, that's no sub- you know, Disney World is no substitute at all. There's nothing at Disney World that's as awesome as just relaxing at the beach. But generally speaking, Disney World and vacationing at the beach are, um, they, they, uh, they provide the same kind of utility, which is free time uh, enjoyment, okay? So they are substitutes for each other, all right? So the idea of substitutes is substitutes provide the same kind of utility that another product provides, okay? Complements, on the other hand, they are products that go hand in hand. They go together. When you buy one, you would buy the other. For example, if you are going to go on vacation, you may fly, right? And so you may buy an airline ticket uh, or four airline tickets or six airline tickets. I don't know, depending on how many people are going. Um, And when you arrive where you're going, you're going to need some place to sleep. And so you may get a hotel room. So airline tickets and hotel rooms are often seen as complements. That's why they both fall under the category of, in a way, they kind of fall under the category of hospitality. But technically, airline travel falls under transportation, okay? Um, But they go together. On the other hand, you could say, well, instead of flying, I may drive to my vacation. And so driving to to wherever you're going on vacation is a substitute for airline travel. And so you can see complements are things that go together. When you buy one of them, you'll buy the other one probably also. But substitutes, in order to buy one, you're going to have to decide not to buy the other one, okay? And that's why these goods, these uh, uh, goods are related to each other. So here's the idea. If you remember that when the price of a complement goes up or down, it causes the quantity demanded for the other product to go up or down. And when the price of a substitute goes up or down, it causes the, quanti- causes the quantity demanded of the other product to go up or down. So the here, the well, for either one of these, the price of uh, X affects the quantity demanded of the other product of Y. So when we have an increase or decrease, when we have a, pr- a price change in one product, and that affects the quantity demanded of another product, we call that a related, we call those related goods, and the elasticity that we calculate when we do this is called cross-elasticity of demand because we're crossing over from the market of X into affecting the market for Y. And so here's our formula right up here. We're going to change, we're going to use the same exact formula, Percentage change in quantity demanded divided by the percentage change in da, da, da. Okay, so here's the deal. Percentage change in price. But we have to modify this just a little bit. Up here, it's the percentage change in quantity demanded of good X when there's a percentage change in the price of good Y. So we have a price change in one market and a quantity demanded change in another market. Okay? And the reason for that is because, uh, remember, with prices of related goods, just like with income, it causes the demand curve, causes the demand curve to shift either to the right or it causes the demand curve to shift to the left. And if you're not sure about that, I recommend going back to the lesson, I believe, I want to say it's like two lessons or th- maybe three lessons ago where we went over the determinants of supply and demand. Okay? All right, so what I'm going to do is we're going to do maybe two examples. We'll just do two examples. So get ready to calculate. You'll want to have a calculator. Maybe you're, you're definitely going to want some, some, your notes in front of you, uh, some, a pen and, and some paper. And we're just going to do two examples here of cross-elasticity of demand. Oh, I didn't change this here. So we're going to have the new quantity of demand, quantity demanded of good X, minus the old quantity demanded of good X, over the average quantity demanded of good X. And then in, in the denominator, it's going to be the new price of good Y minus the old price of good Y divided by the average price of good Y. And so here's our first example. 
let's say that the price of y, the price of good y, changes from 23 up to 24. And when that happens, the quantity demanded of good x goes from 300 up to 320. So let's go ahead and do this calculation. You may want to, you could pause it and try to do it ahead of me because you already know how we, we you've been doing these already for, you know, for several of these. Um, uh, we're going to put the quantity demanded in the numerator. So we're going to do new quantity demanded minus old quantity demanded. So 320 minus 300 divided by average quantity demanded, which is 310. Halfway between 320 and 300 is 310. And then divided by, now we're going to have the percentage change in price. New price is 24 minus old price is 23. Halfway between 24 and 23 is 23.5. So we'll grab a calculator here. 320 minus 300 is 20. So 20 divided by 310. So in the numerator, we have 0 0.0645, 0 0.064516. And so basically what we have here is a 6.5% increase in quantity demanded. Denominator 24 minus 23 is 1 divided by 23.5. That gives us 0 0.04. 2553. 2553. Five, five, and basically, that means about a 4.3% increase in price. So, the price of good Y went up by about 4.3%. And when that happened, the quantity demanded of this other product went up by 6.5%. So, people want more of this stuff because the price of the other thing went up. And when we do the division here, this is what we'll get. Divided by this number, we get 1.516. 1 1.516. Now, because this number is larger than 1, we would say that it is elastic demand. Okay? But here's the weird thing. It's hard to say what that really... What, what that re it, well, I'll tell you in a few minutes what it means. But what we're going to say is that this is very elastic. The most important thing about this number right now is that this number is positive. Okay, So we have a positive cross-elasticity of demand. Let's do another example over here now. Let's say the price, I don't know, we use different letters. Let's say the price of good A, where are we here? There we go. Uh, goes from 5,000 5, up to 5,150. Okay? And when that happens, the quantity demanded of some other product, which we're going to call product B, good, good B, uh, goes from 190 units and it decreases to 180 units. Okay? So let's go ahead and do the calculation. Why don't you try to do the calculation yourself, and then I'll do it. All right, so, um, so we'll do our quantity demanded in the numerator. We're going, uh, our new quantity demanded is 180. Our old quantity demanded is 190. Halfway between the two is 185. Now we're going to divide that by our new price of the other product is 51.50 minus the old price of that other product, which is 5,000, and halfway between these two, halfway between 5,000 and 5,150 is 5,075. You can do it yourself and you can prove, I'll show you, you can see for yourself that, that that's the average, okay? And so um, let's go ahead and calculate this. 180 minus 190 is negative 10. We're going to divide that by 185 and we get negative 0.05 4054, 4054, divided by, in the denominator here, 5150 minus 5000, that's 150, divided by 5075, that gives us 0 
9557. 9557. All right? And so here we have about a 5.4% decrease in quantity demanded when there was a, about a 3% increase in price. So the price of this went up and people stopped buying as much of this. When the price of this went up, people bought less of this product. And if we do this division here, I want you to think about what that probably means about these products. Here's what we get, negative 1.83 negative 1.83. So now the question is, what does this positive elasticity of demand mean and what does this negative elasticity of demand mean? Well, it means something very specific. I'm going to tell you two things about these numbers. The first one is this. When the price went up here, quantity went up on the other thing. And the only time that's going to happen is when you're dealing with substitute products. The price of that went up so people stopped buying it, they went over to this market and they started buying over here. So we had an increase in price over here and an increase in quantity demanded over here. So these products, these two products, X and Y, they must be substitutes. Now, what does the number itself mean, the magnitude of the number? Well, here's the idea. The larger the magnitude of your elasticity, the more related that the products are. The closer that this number is to zero, closer to zero means that they are less related to each other. Okay, so if you had like a, like a zero cross elasticity of demand, that means that the price of one thing changed and the quantity demanded of the other thing didn't really change at all. Okay. All right, so the fact that this is larger than one means that these products, they're kind of related to each other. This price change kind of affected this, the quantity demanded of this other product. Now over here, what happened is we had an increase in price and it resulted in a decrease in quantity demanded. Because the price of that went up, people bought less of that thing over there. The price of airline tickets went up, so people uh, stayed at fewer hotels because they're related to each other because they're complements. And so whenever you have a negative cross elasticity of demand, that means that those two products, products A and B, those are complements of each other. They go with each other. And the larger the magnitude, this one's almost two, so that's pretty good. Again, the larger the magnitude, the more related they are to each other. And the closer that the, that the uh, magnitude is to zero means that they are less related. Okay, well, that's all I have for cross elasticity of demand. Last one we're going to work on now is price elasticity of supply. All right, so price elasticity of supply is a little harder to understand. Okay, it's a little more complicated, it's a little more theoretical. And because of that, I'm just going to give you sort of, uh, we're going to do some problems where we calculate the price elasticity of supply. We're going to call it elastic or inelastic or unitary elastic. And then at the very end, I'm going to give you just some basic conclusions that we understand in economics. Okay. But what I'm going to do is be, in case you're interested in maybe some deeper understanding of price elasticity of supply, I'm going to give you another video, a separate video that shows you a graphical description of price elasticity of supply and price elasticity of demand and how it affects taxes, the burden of tax. But we'll talk about that in just a little bit, okay? All right, so price elasticity of supply, we're going to use the exact same formula, only now it's going to be the percentage change in quantity supplied when there is a percentage change in price. Okay, so again, we're, we've got a market graph, we've got a quantity, and we've got a price, but now, instead of dealing with the demand curve like we did with the other three elasticities, we're dealing with the supply curve. And let's remember the law of supply, which says that the higher the quantity, 
the higher the price has to be, that there is a positive relationship between quantity and price. Okay, And so over here, we're going to say new, our, our calculation is going to go like this, new quantity supplied minus old quantity supplied over divided by average quantity supplied divided by percentage change in price, which is going to be new price, new price minus old price divided by average price. Okay? Now, because there's a positive relationship between quantity and price based on the law of supply, uh, if this number is negative, this one is also going to be negative. And if this one's positive, this one's also going to be positive. What I mean to say is that price elasticity of supply is always going to be a positive number because you're either doing a positive divided by a positive or you're doing a negative divided by a negative. Okay? All right. Another, another thing that you need to understand about price elasticity of supply is that technically it's not new and old. We're not dealing with changes in prices here. What we're really dealing with is theoretical possibilities. Okay, So uh, a, a business could be confronted with two possible market prices. They could be in a situation where the market price is, let's say, you know, $33. And what they're trying to, what the question that they would need to a answer is this, is if, if the price, if the market price was $33, oops, that's 30. If the market price was $33, what would you produce? How much would you produce? if the market price was $33. And let's say that that company said, well, if the market price was $33, we would be able to produce, um, let's say, 7,000 units. And then a completely separate situation, what if the market price instead, what if the market price was $37? Then how much would you produce? Well, if the market price was $37, we'd probably produce 8,000 units. Okay? And so this is not an actual, it's, it's not that prices going up from 33 to 37 and so they're increasing their production from 7,000 to 8,000, but it's, it's more of a current situation, the situation we are in at this one moment, a momentary situation. In this particular moment, if the price was 33, we would produce 7,000. But if the price was 37 in the market, we would produce 8,000. And given that information, we could then calculate the price elasticity of supply for that particular producer at that particular moment. Now, five months later, their situation may change. All right, so let's go ahead and use this as our example. Let's go ahead and calculate. Uh, and typically what I do is I do the, with price elasticity of supply is I just do larger minus smaller, okay? So uh, quantity supplied is going to go in the numerator, so it's going to be 8,000 minus 7,000 divided by the average between the two, which is 7,500, big divided by uh, larger price, 37, that goes along with the 8,000, minus 33 goes along with the 7,000 over average between 37 and 33 is 35. And so, let's get a calculator around here. I just had it. Oh, there it is. All right. 8,000 minus 7,000, that's 1,000, divided by 7,500. So their flexibility, and that's what we're, we're going to talk about here, is that the, diff the number that we calculate here is a question of flexibility. Price elasticity of supply is a question of how flexible a producer is in being able to respond to different changes in market prices. Okay, so, um, so we've got 0 0.13333 that's the numerator. Now down here 37 minus 33 that's 4 divided by 35 that gives us 0 0.114286 4286. 
Okay? And when we run this calculation, we're going to go that one, numerator divided by denominator, and we get 1.167. And so because this number is larger than 1, we're going to say that price elasticity of supply is elastic. Okay? And what that means is this, is that this producer has a, a good amount of flexibility in responding to different market prices. Now, what that means is this. Let me give you an example. Let's say that somebody owns a business and it's a, um, I don't know, it's, a, it's a, a, a pest control business, right? They've got the chemical that kills the pest, right? They've got the little pump things that they go around and they spray. They have to have employees to drive to people's houses to spray the stuff in their house or around the edge of their house. And that maybe they have to have a truck, a small truck or a car that they can put all their supplies in so they can drive to people's houses and spray for bugs. Okay? That kind of a business, in my opinion, is the most expensive thing for that business is probably, well, aside from marketing, the most expensive thing for them is really their labor. They have to have lots of people that can drive to lots of houses because the chemical probably isn't as expensive. Uh, they could actually uh, have the employee use their own car and they can be compensated for using their own car. They really just got to buy the little, the little sprayer thing and all the additional accoutrements that go along with, uh, with stopping pests around the house, right? So that kind of business is not very capital intensive. Capital intensive means that you have to spend a lot of money on capital. That kind of a business is probably more labor intensive. You're going to spend more of your money on labor than you're going to spend on capital, percentage wise, in terms of costs. Okay? Businesses that tend to be more labor intensive, they're able to respond to changes in the price changes in the market more flexibly. They are more elastic. If the price is going to, if the market price for pest control goes up, and they're like, hey, we want to get a lot more business because the price went up. You know, we can, because the price goes up, we can afford now to increase our quantity supplied. And so can they easily change their quantity supplied? Sure, they can just hire some more people. It doesn't take probably, I'm not going to say it's a, it doesn't take any skill. I'm saying that the kind of job you can probably train the person. They don't, they're not required to have a certificate. They're not required to have a license, not a license the way a doctor has to have a license. Um, so you can probably get employees pretty e easily compared to other kinds of, of jobs. Uh, and then all you have to do is get more pump sprayers and get some more chemical, which you're already buying. Uh, and, then, and then get a couple more cars and bam, you're out there, you have increased your quantity supplied. On the other hand, let's say that there's a business that has a big factory and they have lots of machines and it's really expensive. It's like a, it's like a $25 million facility, okay? And most of the production is done by the machines and the people that work at the factory they keep the factory going, but the factory is doing most of the actual production and the people are just making sure the machine is, is working, okay? In that kind of a business, if the price went up and you wanted to increase your production, you might have to actually go build a whole nother factory in the short run because you, in the short run, you can't build another factory, right? In the short run, your fixed costs are uh, are fixed, right? Your, your, your capital costs are usually fixed. And so you can't, your, your, the flexibility of your production is not very elastic because you are limited by how much capital you have produced. You could hire more people, but that's gonna, not going to mean that you can make more stuff in the factory. Uh, that just means you have more people to take care of the machines. And so typically, capital intensive businesses often have uh, less, they're less elastic in their price elasticity of supply. They are less flexible. And so when this number is a larger number, that business is more flexible in their ability to respond to chain price changes in the market, where a lower elasti elasticity means that they're less flexible in being able to respond to change price changes in the market. Okay, So let's do uh, one more example here. Let's say... All right, let's erase this. 
let's say that if the price in the market, if the price in the market was seventeen dollar or seventeen yen or I don't know seventeen, if the price in the market was seventeen, uh, the that this business would be able to supply four hundred and twenty units. But if the price was twenty one, they would be able to supply four hundred and fifty units. Okay, so let's go ahead and calculate price elasticity of supply. If you want to, pause the video, calculate it yourself. All right, so now I'm going to do it. I'm going to put the quantity supplied. Larger is 4, 450 minus 420 over the average between the two is uh, 435. And then in the denominator here, we're going to have our change in our percentage change in price. Larger is 21 minus 17 over the average between the two is 19. So now I'll get Get a calculator here. There's my calculator. All right, so 450 minus 420, that's 30, divided by 435. So in the numerator, I have a 0 0.06, 8966, 896. That sounds familiar. We did another example that had that same percentage. In the denominator, we got 21 minus 17, that's 4, divided by 19, and that's 0 0.21. That's big, that's 21%. 0.210526, So if there was a 21% change in the price, quantity supplied would only change by about 7%. That doesn't sound very good. Okay, so if we go ahead and do the division here, we'll have this divided by this. When I say it doesn't sound very good, I mean it's, it doesn't sound very flexible. And we get 0.328. This number is much smaller than one, so this would be inelastic. Inelastic price elasticity of supply. So supply is inelastic to a change in price. That means that this company is much less flexible in their ability to respond to a change in the market price. Okay? All right, we only have one more thing that we're going to talk about, and that is taxes. All right, so the last thing we're going to talk about here with elasticity is we're going to talk about the relationship between elasticity and taxes. Now, when I say taxes, this is what I mean. Uh, the government imposes or levies taxes onto consumers and also onto businesses. When the government forces demanders or suppliers to pay taxes regarding a certain product, it affects the other party. So if demanders have to pay a tax, then suppliers are going to feel it because demanders don't have as much money to go buy stuff from the suppliers. And so uh, the, what's interesting, this is really interesting, I think it's interesting, you don't have to, but I do, is that how taxes affect suppliers and demanders really depends in, in, in much part on the price elasticity of demand and the price elasticity of supply of that product in that industry or in that market, okay? And so what I want to do first is this, is I'm going to break out here right now and I'm going to show you uh, four terms that are important to understand and I want you to write down the definitions. Okay, so these are four definitions I want you to write down and put in your notes. You can see here we have these four terms, impact of taxation, burden of tax, tax shifting, and incidence of taxation. So let's talk about what is the impact of taxation. The impact of taxation is uh, the, the, the party. Now when I say party, I'm referring to suppliers or demanders. So impact of taxation refers to the party on which the tax is levied. That's the person who actually sends their money to the government. Okay? The party who carries the impact of taxation is not always the one who carries the burden of tax. What that means is that the, the, if, if a company has to pay a tax to the government, they could actually uh, collect that money from the demanders and, and no longer actually be the ones paying the tax, even though the company is the ones sending the check to the government. The burden of tax, that is the party that in the end, after everything has settled, they're the ones that actually experience the tax that is levied. And tax shifting, that's when the party 
that is experiencing the impact of taxation, they're able to shift the, bur the, the tax, that tax amount over to another party. So like suppliers shifting the burden of tax over to demanders. Similarly, demanders can shift the burden of tax over to suppliers. So demanders could experience the impact of taxation, but in the end, the suppliers actually experience the burden of that tax. The last one is the incidence of taxation. It's the reduction in real income that people experience after a tax has been shifted to them. So basically, if, if suppliers are charged a tax, but they shift it over to me, the buyer, I now have to pay out more money. And so the incidence of that is I can't buy other things. If I have to pay an extra $50 for something I normally buy because of a tax, now I can't spend that $50, let's say, to go out to eat on Friday nights. So that is, so it's important to understand these four terms. All right, so I'm going to give you just a quick example of how tax shifting works and how uh, the, and the incidence of taxation and the burden of tax and then the, the uh, incidence of tax. Um, so uh, one product that is, all, that is taxed probably a good bit, I'm not in the industry, but I, I'm sure that it's taxed a good bit, is gasoline, okay? Uh, so you don't know that gasoline is taxed because when you go to the store, well, it's not that you don't know, it's just that when you go to gas up your, your tank, whatever price you see on the sign, that's exactly what they charge you, right? You're like, hey, there's not even a sales tax on, on gasoline. Well, that's because gas companies, gas stations, they put the tax into the number that you see on the sign, okay? So you're basically seeing the price that you are ultimately paying with all the taxes included. And because we need gasoline, we're going to buy it anyway, right? And so when the let's say that the price of gas, if the price of gas is $2.17 a gallon, and I know it's got the little nine, nine tenths, right? I'm going to ignore that for now. If gas is $2.17 a gallon, and then the government comes in and charges a 20 cent tax per gallon, the question is, who is going to pay that 20 cents that 20 cent tax. Is the gas station gonna just say, oh man, that really stinks. Now I'm only gonna make $1.97 per gallon because it, when so, every time somebody buys one gallon for $2.17, I have to take 20 cents of that money and send it off to the government. Well, that could happen. And you won't feel anything as the, as the buyer, as the demander of gasoline. But because you really want to buy gasoline, you know what's actually probably really going to happen? Is the gas station is going to say, oh man, the government is charging me a 20, a 20 cent tax on every gallon. I'm just going to raise, the, I'm just going to raise gas to $2.37 a gallon. I'm not going to pay any of it. I'm going to make all, my, all the consumers pay it. And if, you know, generally all the gas stations, if they're all doing the same thing, there's nothing you can do about it. You don't even know. All you saw was that gas went up by 20 cents a gallon. And because the price of gas goes up and down and up and down and up and down, you just do it, right? You just go pay it. You're like, whatever gas is, I got to put gas in my car. So what's happening here is this, is that the gas stations are experiencing the, um, the impact of taxation. I want to make sure I get I picked my right word here, right? Yeah. The gas stations are experiencing the impact of taxation. So the impact of taxation is on the supplier. And then through tax shifting, they just pass the tax. They just pass the tax over to the demanders. And the demanders experience the burden of, the ta the, of taxation. Suppliers have to pay the tax. They have to send the check to the government. But then they shift that tax over to demanders. So the demanders are the ones who are actually losing money. The suppliers aren't losing any money. The demanders are losing money. And whoever's losing money, those are the people experiencing the burden of tax. And now, because demanders have less money to spend because they're taking on this burden of tax, 
they are, uh, however much money they're losing, however much money demanders can't, can't spend in other markets on other things, that is called the incidence. That's called the incidence of the tax, the incidence of taxation. And the larger the tax that the government imposes on these suppliers, the supplier will do their best to move that tax over to demanders, and now that's going to affect the, the, the economy. That's going to affect the economy because it's not the suppliers that are going to lose out, it's the demanders that are going to lose out. Now, in some cases, the suppliers are not able to shift the tax. And when they're not able to shift the tax, that means that the burden of tax stays with the supplier and the incidence of taxation would be whatever suppliers now can't do. Now suppliers, typically the incidence of taxation for suppliers will be they can't supply as much because their costs are higher. And now I want you to think back to determinants of supply and demand from a few lessons ago. And one of the determinants of supply and demand, or excuse me, of supply, one of the determinants of supply, if you recall, is taxes. That when taxes go up, that's a, that means production costs have gone up for suppliers, and that results in a decrease in supply. Okay? And so the in incidence of taxation can either result in um, a change in demand because that affects their income. When, when, when demanders lose money, that's a decrease in their income effectively. And so demand will decrease. Or if suppliers can't shift the tax over to demanders, then they will keep the burden of tax and the incidence of taxation will be a decrease in supply because production costs have, have now gone up. Producers will be able, or suppliers will be able to supply less. Okay? All right. So that's the idea of these four concepts that I just communicated to you. Okay? All right. So here's really, there's only two things. There's two possibilities. When there's taxes, either demanders, either demanders will pay more of the tax meaning demanders will take on the burden of taxation, or suppliers will pay more of the tax. And what that means is that the burden of tax, the burden of taxation is falling more on the suppliers. And here's what I want to tell you, is that the relationship between elasticity and taxes is that there are certain circumstances in which demanders will carry the burden of taxation and other circumstances where the suppliers are more likely to carry the burden of taxation. And it has to do with the price elasticity of demand and the price elasticity of supply. All right? And so here's, I'm just going to make a little, a really simple really, really simple chart here, okay? And so here's the deal, very simply, I want you to write this down, okay? Is that when price elasticity of demand is less elastic, in fact, let's just say inelastic, inelastic demand results in demanders having to pay more of the tax, but, more elastic demand, okay, so if the price elasticity of demand is elastic or highly elastic, then the suppliers are going to have to pay more of the tax. They're going to carry the burden of taxation. Okay, I'm going to put up here burden of taxation. Okay, regardless of who uh, regardless of the impact of taxation, regardless of which one is actually sending the check to the government, ultimately, the final result is the burden of taxation, okay? And so, uh, price elasticity of demand. Now, for price elasticity of supply, it is the opposite. 
when price elasticity of supply is more elastic, meaning suppliers are able to, they're very flexible in the, in the change in price in the market, uh, or we'll just say elastic, then demanders are actually going to wind up paying more of the tax. Now this is a little more, a little more difficult to explain, and so what, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to do another video. In the next video, in the next lesson, you're going to have a chance to see graphically why this is true. And then of course over here, just to finish it up, when price elasticity of demand is less elastic, or we'll say inelastic, suppliers are less flexible to changes, uh, uh, to changes in, in the market price. And a part of the uh, consequence of having that lack of flexibility is that suppliers wind up paying more of the tax. Uh, or carrying more of the burden of taxation. And then in terms of the incidence of taxation, the incidence of taxation, when demanders have to pay more of the tax, that means that their income has gone down. They have less income. Income goes down and that affects demand and that affects the demand curve right now when it goes down if if a product is a normal good that means that people will buy less of it but if if it's but for other products inferior goods they'll actually buy more of it so so demanders paying more tax m might actually be good for some companies that sell inferior goods but when suppliers have to pay more of the tax, that means that, um, that production costs, production costs are uh, increase because it's just, it's just another cost. The tax is just another cost. And when production costs go up, if you recall back to, the, to how production costs affect the supply curve, okay, uh, that's going to cause a decrease, a decrease in supply and then that's going to affect the market the equilibrium price equilibrium quantity in the market and all that stuff okay so here is the relationship between elasticity and taxes and we are done learning about elasticity uh i hope uh, i hope this helps a good bit uh, if you're not sure something maybe go back and re-watch portions of the video or uh, send me an email or uh, ask me something in class okay all right i'll see you in the next lesson